Good evening. I'm delighted to be here to talk to you this evening. There used to be an old radio quiz game called Animal, Vegetable or Mineral, where the panel tried to guess what a mystery object might be from such questions. Today's talk will cover all those categories, from the many natural fibres which have been used in the making of airships and, and balloons, and also some of the artificial fibres in use today. I will also take a look at some of the coatings used and some of the ways these have been tested. There will, I hope, be no mystery objects. In 1888, when we are part way into at least the western part of this story, Major James Lethbridge Brook Templer found himself on trial for his honour and his career. Templer was the British Army's leading promoter of the military use of balloons, having founded its balloon manufactory and school in 1878 which would ultimately morph into the Royal Aircraft Establishment. However, ten years later, he was being court-martialed for betraying vital technical secrets which might have reached the Italian government. Fortunately for Templer, the nation was rather rarely for those times not actually at war, so he wasn't on trial for his life, but he was charged with revealing the secrets of how the British Army used cow guts in its balloons. But there are other earlier parts to the story of balloon materials, and we will return to Templar and the Calguts later. Spoiler alert, he was acquitted and eventually rose to the rank of Colonel. So starting off with envelope fabrics made from plant materials, the earliest hot air balloons were Chinese sky lanterns, for which the earliest records are in the first century of the present era in the Eastern Han Dynasty. Chinese sky lanterns were made of rice paper, although this is confusing in English, as such paper was nothing like the edible rice paper used in baking, which is made from a slurry of cooked rice grains. The sort of rice paper used for lanterns or balloons was made from the fibres of the straw of the rice plant and would have been very tough. Other Chinese papers might be made either from the pith of the Tetrapanax papifera shrub or from the inner bark of the paper mulberry tree and these fibre sources gave a far stronger paper than the familiar culinary rice paper. From the European viewpoint, the starting point is always taken to be the launches of the balloons made by the Montgolfier brothers in France. Here is their first major public balloon launch, without a basket, as it was an uncrewed balloon launched from Annonay in southeastern France in 1783. This followed some much smaller experimental silk cuboid balloons the year before. This balloon was made from sackcloth, perhaps made from jute, lined with three layers of thin paper. The globe shape had a volume of about 800 cubic metres and was made in four pieces, held together with 1800 buttons and supported with an external fishing net. The use of paper was not so much to prevent the loss of hot air as to make the sackcloth more taut. That paper was involved is not wholly surprising, given that the Montgolfier family were France's leading paper manufacturers of the period, and the paper being made by the Montgolfier family, or indeed any other European makers at that time, was made from rags, usually linen rags, which were beaten to yield the necessary fibre soup from which paper is made. Linen itself is, of course, made from the stem fibres of the flax plant in a rather laborious process. As cotton became more widely available from the East and eventually from the Americas, it became the favoured rag type for paper making until in 1844, Canadian Charles Fennerty and German Friedrich Gottlob Keller invented the machine and associated process to make use of wood pulp in paper making, which resulted in a cheaper but not necessarily stronger paper becoming more widely available. Cotton itself comes in a number of botanical varieties of which the Sea Island or Egyptian cottons were considered the best due to the longer length of the fibres in the seed head fluff, which makes the threads longer and stronger, important both for cloth and paper. Both cotton and linen fabrics continued to be used for balloons well into the 20th century. Frequent mentions are found in the technical and historical literatures of cotton, cotton cambric and calico, with linen in either a finely woven or canvas form. Other fabrics included sackcloth from the fibres of the jute plant, bottom right, and also Chinese rami, which produces long stem fibres similar to those derived from the nettle family. 
Rami was not commonly used, but is recorded in use as late as 1928, when its strength and resistance to rot or mildew were influential in its use in the famous Graf Zeppelin LZ-127. In the case of stem fibres such as rami, flax or jute, the stems have first to be partly rotted to break down the lignin structure, and then the fibres are stripped out and cleaned before carding and spinning. Con cotton is a more direct process, only needing the fluffy seed heads to be processed to remove the seeds from the lint before spinning can commence. Here we can see some examples of airships recorded as using various plant fibre woven fabrics. Tissandier's was made from cotton cambric and de la Volpe from rubberized yellow cambric. To overcome the unavoidable problem inherent in a woven fabric, namely the holes where the warp and weft threads overlap, it was usual for there to be more than one layer of cloth, with one layer cut on the bias so that direction to the threads in one layer were at a diagonal to those in another layer. Almost universally, such woven fabrics would be either varnished or coated with several layers of rubber solution, this orangey-brown colour I've shown here, on one or both sides to help keep the hot air or gas from seeping out too quickly. Each layer of fabric would be coated individually and the layers glued together with more of the same coating. I mentioned the, the 1800 buttons used to attach the panels of the first Montgolfier balloon, which tells us that balloon envelopes in the earliest days were not made as a whole item, but were transported as separate panels and assembled on site the buttons, and later on a system of interlinked loops or frogging, were efforts to make this process as fast as possible at the launch ground. Very soon all that changed and sewn seams were used with varnished or rubberized taping, much as in today's tents and waterproof jackets. <coughs> there are very few lighter than air craft for which the envelope can be described as being made from minerals until we get to the very modern balloons and airships made from fossil fuel and artificial fibres. We will come to them later, but in the meanwhile, here are a few of what I can only describe as eccentric, not to say colossally expensive, experiments with metal sheeting. This is Marais Monge's copper balloon made in 1847. Uh, it was made from soldered copper sheeting. I'm not sure what year it was actually made, but we, we, he gives his very full report about it in his 1847 book, Etudes sur les Station, or Studies in Ballooning. The copper was supported on an internal wooden structure, which I show part of on the right, um, a part of which um, is shown on the right. It was deconstructed and withdrawn at the conclusion of construction. To ensure gas tightness, he lined the copper envelope with two layers of paper. Sadly, this balloon never flew due to a failure with the hydrogen supply. He spent 25,000 francs on this project, which equates to about one and a half million pounds in today's money. Must have been very beautiful. Hungarian Jewish timber merchant David Schwartz's idea was for a radical departure into an all rigid aluminium sheeting exterior with a conventional linen gas envelope within. Schwartz entered into partnership with Karl Berg to build this extraordinary experimental rigid airship for the Prussian government. It had an aluminium outer shell containing the linen gas bags, but was a failure due more to a lack of understanding of the structural stresses taken by the skin rather than the materials as such. Sadly, Schwartz died just before its maiden flight and it was left to his widow, Melanie, to complete the airship with Berg. Berg then went on to build a second such airship with a little more success, which it did actually fly, but the crew lost control of it and it crashed on its first flight. Two aluminium airships were built in 1929, one civilian by Thomas Benton Slate and one military for the US Navy. Slate, a prolific patent holder, made a fortune from the refrigeration business and spent it building his City of Glendale airship with a unique combination of duralumin ribs covered with corrugated duralumin gauze, which were about 0.3 millimetres thick. Even more unusual was Slate's patented propulsion method consisting of a steam turbine powered fan on the airship's nose, drawing in the air ahead of it and blowing it along the outside of the hull. The concept 
was to suck the ship forward from its partial vacuum at the front, whilst also pushing it forwards with this blast of air. This sadly did not work and had to be replaced with an ordinary aero engine. But the airship never flew, as even the winter sun of December was enough to expand the hydrogen to such a pressure that rivets started popping out all over. The US Navy's ZMC-2 was the only successful all-metal airship ever built. Designed by Ralph Alp Upson, it was built by the Detroit Aircraft Corporation from Alclad, which was a corrosion-resistant aluminium sheet formed from high-purity aluminium surface layers metallurgically bonded to high-strength aluminium alloy core material. The airship was assembled using riveting, and the lifting gas was helium rather than hydrogen. The helium was held directly within the hull, not in separate envelopes, and so air-filled ballonets were required in order to manage pressure changes. The US Navy used it from 1929 to 1941, during which time it logged over 2,000 hours of flight time. Moving on now to the animal kingdom, cows and moths. The first animal-based material I will consider is silk. This is derived from the threads which the mulberry moth caterpillar spins around itself to make its cocoon. The secret of its use is attributed to Si Ling, the wife of Chinese Emperor Huang Te, some 5,000 years ago. The secret made its way very slowly westwards, ultimately arriving in Britain with migrants from continental Europe, probably in the 15th century. The basic method to attain the fibres is that the cocoons are boiled alive and the threads caught with a twig and gathered onto a spool for spinning and then weaving, which is what is shown being undertaken in this Chinese image. Here is the same process in a more industrialised setting in a photo from the Syrian silk industry. A large part of this labour intensive industry was a female labour force and we will also see women seamstresses hand sewing the early cotton and silk balloon envelopes, although history never only ever records the names of the famous men, the Montgolfiers, the Charles, etc., as the makers of the balloon, when more properly I think we would say that they were the commissioners of the balloon. Here is the Antico Setificio Fiorentino, or Ancient Florentine Silkworks. Originally founded in Florence in 1786, today, as in the past, its six hand-operated 18th century looms and its six semi-mechanical 19th century looms are weaving silks in the traditional way. Probably the two most famous early balloons were the first crude hot air balloon by the Montgolfier brothers in 1783 and in, in the same year the first ever gas, as in hydrogen, balloon by Professor Charles and the Robert brothers. Both balloons, extremely fanciful in design and decoration, presumably with an eye to the maximum publicity value, were made from silk. The Montgolfier brothers' balloon is described as being made from paper covered with taffeta, which is a kind of smooth silk cloth. As well as its elaborate painted decoration, the silk envelope was also apparently varnished with alum as a fireproofing precaution. Another of their balloons had an envelope of two layers of cotton with three layers of crumpled paper in between. Curiously, the use by the Montgolfiers of alum seems to be a rare mention of any concern with the flammability of the covering fabrics of their coatings in relation to balloons or airships. There were some supposedly fire retardant dopes on the market during the First World War, but as the bulk of the dope ingredients was what we would now call high volatile organic compounds, I'm not sure how much a bit of boric acid might have actually helped. Professor Charles silk balloon was covered, coated in a rubber solution devised by the Robert brothers. This basic method of reducing the permeability to the tiny hydrogen molecule was in common use until well into the 20th century. In the following year, Meunier launched his non-rigid airship. It was made of two layers of varnished Florence taffeta silk. We know a great deal about this airship because a full Report, the full quantities report still exists, detailing the weights and costs of each part of the airship. A square metre of this silk weighed 58 grams and one layer of varnish a further 63 grams. 
However, for two thicknesses of silk and the necessary five layers of varnish, that's including the one to join them together, meant a total weight per square meter of 475 grams. The total weight of his balloon's envelope with all its parts came to over 19 tons, and that's not including the cordage or the gondola. The document then goes on to calculate moments of inertia, etc., before providing the staggering amount of money required, one and a half million French livres, which seems to convert to 100 and, nearly 117,000 pounds, and that isn't even at today's prices. His balloon was built in 1784, so that was just two years too early for its silk to have been made at the factory in Florence that I showed earlier, but presumably it was made at a factory that was very similar. Returning now to the unfortunate court-martial of Major Templar. This was all about the supposed secret use of a substance known as goldbeater's skin to make the gas-tight envelopes for hydrogen balloons then in use by the British Army for reconnaissance purposes. In some ways, he brought this upon himself as he had sold the whole idea of the use of goldbeater's skin to the army as this big secret method that no one knew except this one family from the Alsace, the Weinlings, whom he found in the east end of London where they had been making small balloons for a shop selling scientific toys. He had built his reputation on the use of this gold beater's skin and the so-called secret. His defence was based partly upon an alibi that he could not have met the Italian gentleman on the occasion alleged, but also upon his statement in, that in fact the gold beater's skin process was not at all secret and the information could have been got elsewhere, not least as another Italian officer had been with the British Suakim expedition during which many such balloons were in use and he had been given every opportunity there to learn about them. Templar was therefore honourably acquitted. And now, a warning, the next slide is going to be showing pictures of innards. Goldbeater's skin is a material made from the external membrane of the cacum or blind gut of a cow, which is broadly equivalent but much larger to our own appendix. And here you can see it um, in reality and in diagrams. The vast majority, after much, clean, after, after much unpleasant cleaning, the sheets of membrane are removed from the intestine, as in this diagram, scraped as clean as possible and then stretched to dry on frames. So you slit along one side of, of the uh, cacum and you very carefully peel off this membrane from the inner layer and you scrape as much of the revolting this off as you can. The vast majority of the supply of cacums for the balloon and airship needs of the UK came from the Chicago stockyards, where the membranes were cleaned and salted up in packs of 25, rolled up and packed in barrels containing three to 4,000 skins each. The salting of all sorts of meats was a big part of the meat packing industry at the time, and this book was published for the general public who went on conducted tours of the stockyard abattoirs in huge numbers. The ladies on the right were working at the Spencer family's balloon making factory, the building for which is still extant in Highbury. Here we see them undertaking what I imagine to be a pretty disgusting part of the process, removing the membranes in the rough from the barrels in which they had been salted down. Further cleaning in acids and alkalis would be needed to make the sheets very clean of all fat, etc., for use. The process produces sheets of about 20 centimetres by a metre long of very thin vellum type material, which when dry resemble tracing paper. Its original use, from which its name derives, was for making the pages of booklets in which fine, finely beaten gold leaf was kept for gilders to use. I have a small piece here, which you're all welcome to come and have a look at afterwards. This is widely used in both the book conservation field and also for binding the reeds in wind instruments. When damp, these sheets stick to each other without either sewing or glue, so that they can be formed into an almost completely gas tight balloon. The material actually behaves a little like cling film or saran wrap. More than one layer is required. And if as a child you ever covered a party balloon, in strips of newspaper and wallpaper paste to make a papier-mâché globe, you will have an idea of the process. Fifteen skins are required to make one square metre, and the ballonets within a zeppelin 
were each of about 30,000 square metres surface area. So you can see that hundreds of thousands of such pieces were needed per airship. Indeed, Cholet tells us that so many were needed for the World War I airships in Germany that sausage makers in that country and all the countries which Germany occupied were not allowed to use either bovine or pig intestines for sausage skins because they were all needed for war purposes. Cholet goes into very full details of the entire process for transforming pieces of goldbeater skin into actual airship gas envelopes. And whilst it is true that the Vinelings had brought the method of combining pieces of goldbeater skin into balloons with them from Europe, and indeed the family had registered this patent, bottom left, for making inflatable balls and globes in 1829, it is surprising that the Vinelings were granted a patent, considering the method has already been in widespread use for small experimental or toy hydrogen balloons since at least the time when Professor Charles took up his first crude balloon in 1783. Less than a month after the Montgolfier and Charles balloons ascensions, Baron Beau Manoir made a small balloon of about half a metre diameter from goldbeater skin. It was launched but sailed away and was not seen again, but smaller version, versions became quite the fashion as playthings in Paris. That was over a century before Templer was accused of betraying his so-called secret. Indeed, Benjamin Franklin is known to have bought a small one in Paris for his grandson and later posted it deflated to a friend in London to pass along to Sir Joseph Banks at the Royal Society. The actual material of goldbeater skin was no secret but their method of preparing and securely joining up the skins was supposedly, supposedly only known to the Vinelings. The secret was jealously guarded by the family, and when the amount of work required extra workers, considerable obstruction from the family had to be overcome. The Vinelings and Templar started out at the Royal Engineer, Engineers Balloon School at Aldershot in very cramped conditions. They soon moved into these buildings in the photo of Farnborough at the top which was just as well as the military needs for balloons significantly increased with the coming of the Boer War in 1899. In 1901, the balloon section alone required £2,000 to be spent on making or repairing some 14 medium to very large balloons and over a thousand small pilot balloons. The Vinings were said to guard their secret jealousy, jealously, but it's clear that the family must by now have been assisted by many other workers, almost certainly local working class women, as well as having to train up soldiers to do repairs in the field. During the Boer War, the gas envelopes were made in significant quantities for, recon for reconnaissance balloons, and complete balloons were made under the Vinding supervision at the Royal Balloon Factory, were packed in soldered tins for shipping, along with a basic repair kit, and here we can see some members of the Vinding family. The work of making gold beater skin has generally been women's work, and although the secret was brought to the army in 1860 by the male head of the family, Frederick Casimir Weinling, from his death in 1874, it was his widow Anne and her daughters Madeleine, Matilda, Elizabeth and Eugenie who continued the work. They were arguably the UK's first women to be employed by the government in any technical role in the aeronautical field. In 1906, Eugenie was the forewoman of the balloon making workshop, workshop at the Royal Aircraft Factory at Farnborough and the family remained there until the 1920s and the workshop is that lean-to on the right hand side of the airship shed. As a lot of the work of making a balloon or airship is really sewing the fabric panels together, women's needle skills have been employed from the outset. But apart from the bindings, we don't have many names to put to these women. The image on the left is of the workshop where Santos Dumont's number no. six airship was being made from varnished silk. And the other image is from the First World War and is titled Stitch in Time. The sewing machine took its place among the more dangerous instruments of war and balloon factories were filled with women war workers employed on the responsible task of stitching balloon fabrics. On their stitches may depend the lives of the observers. In the Second World War, this kind of work, presumably for barrage balloons, was even apparently farmed out to women to do in their own homes. The ladies in this picture, although working with goldbeater skin, are however not working for the government under the supervision of the Vineling family, 
but for the Short Brothers balloon and airship factory during the Great War. Women at the near left-hand table are coating linen with rubber, while at the second table, gold beater skin is being applied to fabric. In this charming painting by William Russell Flint, we can see women seated in swathes of fabric making the inner or outer envelopes for World War I airships. This was almost certainly painted when he was at the Beardmore's airship works at Inch Innan near Glasgow, as Flint was a naval officer posted there by the Admiralty to oversee airships being made there for naval use, as seen in another of his war paintings in the insect. Coming now to the interwar years, and Britain's most famous airship, the R101. Built at the Royal Airship Works Cardington in Bedfordshire, we know a little bit more about the women involved in the building, in building her, due to some amazing archives recently received by the local museum, a scrapbook of photos and cuttings that includes a few named individuals. The outer covering of the R101 was made up of pre-doped linen panels which, for much of its covering, rather than lacing undoped fabric into place and then applying dope to shrink it. This decision was to have far-reaching and ultimately fatal results, as changes in humidity tended to cause the fabric to tear. The group that made the outer, made the outer covering were known as the outer coverites. The inner coverites, more formally the gas envelope team, made the gas bags which were suspended within the airship's metal structure. That picture top right is of the inner coverite team. The gas envelopes we can see here, being inflated for testing before ins installation, were made from multiple layers of gold beater skin glued to cotton cloth, and this work was the responsibility of the inner coverites. The two groups of workers enjoyed a good deal of friendly rivalry in the various sporting and social events that were a feature of life at the Royal Airship Works. That relay, bottom, relay race bottom left, was won by the outer coverites. Ultimately, of course, the R101 crashed on its maiden voyage, which marked the complete end of airship building in Britain until the experimental airlander airship late in this century. Cardington, however, continued to make lighter than aircraft, and in World War II, it, they were making barrage balloons. This lovely World War II painting by Laura Knight, called In for Repairs, shows women's auxiliary Air Force service women repairing a barrage balloon. The women are using all the techniques of previous generations of lighter than aircraft, sewing, gluing, taping. The barrage balloons were even made from old school fabrics, rubberized cotton. And this era bridges the past with the coming of modern fabrics, as the famed parachute silk from which many a lucky girl's wedding dress might have been made was actually not silk at all, but one of the new generation of artificial fibres, descendants of which are the fabrics from which today's balloons and airships are made. In some ways, we might consider the use of gold beater skin to be more of a coating than a structural component, and now we move on to the liquid coatings. This advertisement from the First World War period is for a rubber solution for use in making airships and balloons gas tight. This type of coating was one of the earliest and commonest forms dating from the 18th century, as we've seen. Confusingly to modern readers, this is often referred to as varnish, but is not to be confused with anything like the sort of varnish used on wood. Captain Léon Chollet's 1922 paper on balloon fabrics and gold beater skin mentions many varnishes used in the earlier days of ballooning, Conte, Chalet and others, with either no recipe known or only some components. The other image here is of a vulcanizer making balloon materials for the US government requirements in the First World War. Four large drums of balloon fabric could be rolled in at one time, and the term vulcanization refers to the heat treatment of natural rubber with sulfur, which cures or hardens the rubber from its naturally soft, sticky state. Here is just one recipe for varnish suitable for balloon fabrics. It comes from Henry Beasley's 1854 book of recipes. He says, melt India rubber, also known as gum elastic or caoutchouc, in small pieces with its own weight of boiled linseed oil and thin it with oil of turpentine. The book has a huge range of recipes and was by no means especially for balloonists, but it would have been normal to ask a local pharmacist to run this sort of thing up for you. 
John Wise was an eminent and innovative American balloonist. In this book, with its gorgeous cover and lavish illustrations, he shares not only detailed accounts of his many balloon adventures, some less successful than others, but also has appendices laying out the technicalities. The science and practice of ascent, as, as understood at the time, and details of how to make the various sorts of balloons and recipes for coatings are all given. Here are just five of the coatings he used. Um, I should tell you, in case you don't know, bird lime is a sticky substance derived from boiling holly bark. It is, of course, now strictly illegal to use it for actually catching birds. Um, interestingly, the fourth century Greek writer Tacitus claimed it had fire retardant properties, but it's not clear if Wise had that in mind. Wise also gets into how to test the coatings and materials. For instance, there is a table of the different colours which different sorts of oils will turn when sulfuric acid is ad added. Mustard oil will apparently turn bluish green, but linseed oil will turn brown to black. Here we see the interior of Weiss's balloon during a test where it was filled with air to detect any holes in the varnishing which needed repainting. Note that the techniques are basically the same as we saw in the Laura Knight painting of the WAS mending a barrage balloon some 110 years later. At the end of the 19th century, the Swedish balloonist Salomon August André designed a balloon for a, pol a polar expedition. Everything was crated up and shipped to the starting point on Svalbard, where a framework a bit like that of an old gas holder was built to support the balloon as it was inflated, and they made their own hydrogen on the spot too. The balloon, originally called Le Pole Nord, was renamed the Urnen, or Eagle. His balloon was made for him by Henri Le Chambre's balloon factory at Vaugirard, three kilometres south of where the Eiffel Tower is today in Paris. In making up the envelope, he employed 600 pieces of pongee silk. Pongee silk can come in a huge variety of thick slubbed silk to the very thinnest fine silk fabrics as light as one tenth of the weight of the silk that Meunier used. And here we see some of his seamstresses. Although Le Chambre was known for his balloons made of baudruche, the French word for gold beater's skin, this one was made from Chinese pongee silk cemented together in four layers and varnished with nitrocellulose, and this may be among the first of the steps into modern coating materials, actually more like a communal garden varnish. And here we can see part of the balloon under construction. This is the R-27 airship constructed for the Royal Naval Air Service at Beardmore's Inch Inn and Works in 1918. It was unfortunately destroyed in a fire at Howden Airship Station, the future site for the construction of the R-100. Her sister ship, the R-29, had a more successful career. The composition of the outer cover of the R-27 and R-29 is not precisely known, but since many aspects of the 23X class were similar to the preceding class, it's likely to have been an un unbleached linen doped with emilite M solution, as in this advertisement. This solution was at least partly composed of cellulose dope, which served to keep the envelope taut, reduce air friction, and probably introduced aluminium dusting to reflect the sunlight. Despite the doping, the 23X class's outer cover had a high absorption rate of rainwater. Even a steady shower could add a ton to the weight of the airship in less than an hour. The cover was expected to be as little inflammable as possible and to be substantially impermeable to hydrogen. But I don't, I'm afraid I do not know if any fire retarding ingredients were included. Moving on now to how the materials might be tested. Thomas Graham, here seen on his stone seat in George Square, Glasgow, and also commemorated in the name of Strathclyde University's Chemical Engineering Building, is mostly remembered today for his fundamental work on the diffusion of gases, which resulted in modern kidney dialysis. However, here we will, of course, be looking at how his work influenced early testing materials, testing, testing methods for airship and balloon fabrics and coatings. His paper of 1866 on the absorption and dialytic separation of gases by colloid septa um, considered the testing, also considered the testing of rubber-coated balloon fabric. It is placed in contact 
with hydrogen on one side and air on the other. The following process is substantially what occurs. Both the hydrogen and the oxygen and nitrogen of the air dissolve in the rubber film and tend to saturate it up to the limits determined by the temperature and by the partial pressure of each gas. Each gas penetrates the rubber film at its characteristic speed and when it reaches the opposite side of the rubber film the gas evaporates from its solution in the rubber because the partial pressure of the gas in question is substantially zero. More of each gas is dissolved continuously on the first side of the fabric and a dynamic equilibrium is reached which continues so long as fresh air and fresh hydrogen are available for the two surfaces. In this manner hydrogen passes through the rubber to the air side and air passes through to the hydrogen side. From which he found that in a given period of time five times as much hydrogen would pass through the balloon fabric than ordinary air. To test the silk for Andre, Andre's polar expedition balloon that we saw earlier, strips of fabric were tested by the Nordenfelt company using this Perro dynamometer. And the test gave the following results. For double layers, the breaking strains varied from 27 to 37 newtons per square metre. For threefold layers, from 32 to 64 newtons per square metre. And for fourfold, made up of the best single pieces found, from 69 to 80 newtons per square metre. The minimum resistance demanded by Andre had been fixed at 11 newtons per square metre, and that was for a single thickness of pongee. This minimum requirement was therefore greatly exceeded. The cemented pieces were classified according to their strength for distribution over the sur surface of the balloon as the strain demanded. This 1910 report produced by the British National Physical Laboratory looked at hydrogen diffusion through balloon fabrics using this equipment. The round drum, G on the right, held the fabric sample and there would have been pure dry air on one side of the fa fabric and as pure as possible a sample of hydrogen on the other. Here are some of their results, clearly showing the superiority of gold beater skin in terms of both weight and permeability. In 1915, the US National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which ultimately became NASA, was testing balloon and airship materials for military purposes. In order that you can have any hope of seeing what this table says, I have transcribed it. This table shows the permeability of the various coatings on a variety of balloon fabrics. This shows that of the coatings in use in America, gelatin on rubber or varnish on rubber are far and away the least permeable compared to rubber solution or varnish alone. It's inter interesting to me that they tested gelatin as one of the coating types since it's mainly made of mainly of collagen, which is also what gold beater skin is largely made of. In its first annual report, the NACA also included one of the reports that had commissioned from the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, presumably because this company was the principal supplier of balloons and airships to the US military. And this report took a strategic look at which aspects of balloons or airship materials could be considered the most important in terms of the work to be undertaken on any future improvements. Here are the results, and based on the two criteria of cost and desirable qualities, in both cases, weight and gas tightness come out on top. They are indeed closely related as the weight of gas resistant coatings on any given fabric can be considerably more than the fabric itself. In 1918, the US Bureau of Standards in a report on the determination of permeability of balloon fabrics written by Junius Edwards laid out the various methods for such tests. Volume loss using the renard surkoff balance and the penetration method using the Barr and Rosenhain apparatus that we saw before. But the Bureau of Standards own test machine is this one, which is quite similar to the Barr and Rosenhain one. It uses the penetration method with a gas interferometer. The effects of temperature, humidity, hydrogen concentration, etc. were tested, but it's difficult to interpret the results given as the test samples are only identified by numbers, for example, balloon material number 22152 and so on. However, the introduction makes clear that they are all variants on a two-ply cotton or silk fabric with a rubber coating on the outside and between the plies. This report 
for the British Admiralty just after the end of the First World War looked at the leakage of gas through various sorts of seams in rubberized airship envelopes. It came to the conclusion that initial workmanship in making the seams was more critical than the actual design. Also, that putting too much rubber solution on seams created such a weight problem locally as to be a positive disadvantage. The author comments that it may be considered that these points are almost childishly elementary and that everybody knows them, but that taking care to have the surfaces as clean as possible, applying plenty of rubber solution as evenly as possible, and avoiding violent rolling of the seams were key to the durable seams. The post-World War II era did not see the end of the use of military airships, somewhat surprisingly. In the 1950s, in parallel with the space race and the Cold War, there was a need for military airships as part of the anti-missile early warning system. They patrolled areas not then covered by radar surveillance and even undertook anti-submarine warfare duties. The N-Class was a line of non-rigid airships built by the Goodyear Aircraft Company of Akron, Ohio for the US Navy. The lift was provided by helium gas rather than hydrogen. And the Z in their class numbers is the US Navy designation for a lighter than aircraft. The ZPG-3W was made of rubberized cotton and the ZPG-2 of Dacron, which is a commercial name for polyethylene terephthalate or PET, the same as drinks bottles are made of today. In 1962, the US Office of Naval Research launched Stratoscope 2. Previous attempts to lift a heavy payload to the stratosphere had actually failed on the ground. This launch was to carry a 10,000 pound payload and needed new materials to make this possible. The balloon was made of mylar, which is the stretched form of PET, sometimes known as biaxially oriented polyethylene terephthalate or BOPET. But the key innovation was the addition of a reinforcement layer consisting of a non-woven network of reinforcing fibres bonded to the mylar by a thermoplastic adhesive. The military specification developed by the F US Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratories in 1956 described requ requirements for polyethylene balloon films. S tensile strength and elongation at room temperature, cold brit brittleness temperature, diaphragm impact toughness and melt index are required tests. Although a gas barrier is a basic requirement of a balloon film, there is no particular requirement in the standard to learn helium permeability. Performance as to altitude and load carrying were compared to reusability and costs. There is also an approximately similar commercial civilian standard for polyethylene film. In the 1960s, there was a lot of discussion about the use of balloons in space and men were even more launched, complete with spacesuits, in very compact gondolas to the mid-level stratosphere using what amounted to sophisticated weather balloons in the Project Manhai Stratolab program. And these balloons were all polyethylene. In 1977, Eleanor Vadala, a materials engineer in the US Naval Air Vehicle Technology Department and herself a successful lifelong balloonist, undertook a study of the airworthiness of the cotton ZPG-3W and the Dacron ZPG-2 airship envelopes that we saw earlier. The envelopes had been in storage since 1961 in less than optimal conditions. The ZPG-3W had been made from two-ply cotton neoprene material with a bias outer ply and straight inner ply. The panels and gore seams of the envelope were bonded, double-stitched and taped and there were four ballonets within the envelope, envelopes made from two-ply neoprene coated nylon fabric. The ZPG envelope was made from a two-ply neoprene coated Dacron polyester fabric bonded together with neoprene and neoprene hypolon, which is kind of aluminium coating on the surface. Its ballonets were constructed of two-ply lightweight nylon. The envelopes had not been stored in a controlled environment and the cotton one had rotted, it, it rotted extensively due to becoming wet and had to be scrapped. The Dacron one, however, was in good enough condition to undertake tests. The inspection consisted of internal and external visual examination plus removal and tests of specimens. Some areas had low interply adhesion due to chemical reactions between the adhesives that had been used and water ingress. Two of the coating types, the neoprene and the hypolon aluminium, had reacted with heat and oxidation 
to yield sulfur, carbon dioxide and hydrogen chloride. The hydrogen chloride plus water had produced hydrochloric acid, which attacked the adhesion at the interface. The Dacron envelope was considered to be suitable for further flight service and was reinforced with reinforcement of the upper surface. And these photos are specimens showing um, good interply adhesion on the left and poor interply adhesion on the right. Modern balloon fabrics and coatings are tested using machines like these. This, these come from the company called McMessen, and they test, for example, Ultra Magic's high performance materials, which are used for racing balloons and insulated balloons for use in colder temperatures, mostly ripstop nylons or polyurethane with silicon coatings. Retracing our steps slightly to take in more balloons involved in space efforts, here is the ECHO-1 satellite. This was a passive communication satellite balloon, or Sataloon, launched in 1962. Essentially, it was really a mirror for reflecting microwave signals, although it had other more political objectives, such as establishing the right for spacecraft to overfly other nations without permission. It was made of metallized mylar or BOPET, and would have been selected for its high tensile strength and gas impermeability. And the picture top right is of the capsule into which the balloon was folded for launch, as shown mounted on the rocket below. Coming right up to date, here are John Powell's stratospheric balloons, again essentially using weather balloons to the edge of space. The greatest height they have been so far is to 130,000 feet or 39 kilometers. The balloons carry tiny school experiments in ping pong balls and are funded by the parallel used by companies to advertise their products in films shot to show the earth below. The commercial side of JP Aerospace is funding John's research project to develop airships which can go even higher into real space and ultimately an orbiting airship. The Ascender Airship's Ultra Shell is a silicon coated two ounce ripstop nylon and the inner helium lifting cell a 0.7 millimeter polyethylene. The truss structure is made of carbon fiber rods with aluminium connectors and the valves and helium pumps are made of carbon fiber and there are a lot of 3D printed parts mainly made of nylon. This is by no means the only project using or developing the use of balloons in space and there are various ideas for soft landing of craft on planets with either no or very thin atmosphere, for which therefore parachutes are useless. Whilst pa paper lantern balloons, more or less the same as the very earliest Chinese ones, are still popular, even if considered an ecological menace in some places, the other materials in the history of lighter than aircraft have pretty much vanished from the scene. The vast expense of silk or gold beater skin has put both well out of reach, even of the most enthusiastic recreators. As we saw in the slide about Ultramagic materials, women are still making balloons. I hope the sections on fabric testing and the space going balloons will serve to convince you that textiles and other soft materials are in fact engineering too. And I encourage those of you who still use Twitter to seek out John Powell as his spacefaring ideas are fascinating. Virtually all balloons and the few airships are now met, nowadays made from a variety of fossil fuel origin, artificial fibres or films, or both. Maybe there will come a time in the future in which, the fully, in which fully renewable fabrics from plants or animals will make a comeback, if anyone can remember how to make them. Thank you.